You come into the UK on September 14th to do proms in the park. They said there were 65,000 people. <laughs> That's, that's, wow, that's, that's a lot of people. <laughs> Does it change your performance? Does it change you? Or I, I wonder how you perceive this because you've done some amazing venues, the best venues in the world, and you've played collectively to millions of people, never mind 60,000. I sing to one person every night. So if there are 2,000 or 5,000 or 65,000, I'm still singing to that one person. It's not going to change for me. I mean, how exciting can it ever be the 65,000 people, but it won't change my performance. I'm still singing to one person. Um, and, uh, uh, I, you know, as far as that goes, you know, maybe I'll have a little nerves or excitement, but once I start, um, it's pretty much um, the same as it always is. I try to crawl into the story of the song and sing it to one person. And that's my job. But, you know, it's always exciting to hear the roar of the crowd, you know. And what's magnificent about your back catalogue is we all know virtually every word and we will sing them back at you. That volume is probably going to be as loud as it gets and thrilling. Is that still surprising even tonight when you start the first word of the first song and the first note and we're already on the same page? Well, you know, as long as it makes them happy, it makes me happy. In the beginning, you know, I thought, don't sing even now with me. I'm, I'm performing. How dare you? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't mind anymore because I see what's going on out there. They love to do it. Well, that's great. That's what I'm there for. I'm there to make them. It's all about them. It's not about me. You know, you ask, you know, your question before, you know, is it about, am I a super, really, no, I am there for those people. That's all I think about. I'm there for them. And if that makes them happy, I'm, Sing along with me, folks. <laughs> you do remind us you're a sex symbol several times oh, in the please. show. I'm kidding. You know I'm <laughs> kidding around. Please. <laughs> and here we are today in another world where you don't technically have to do anything, let alone get on a plane and come to London. Is it still thrilling to be asked? Because they could pick anyone. I always say this in these kind of gigs. Anyone is welcome. There's 60,000 people paying 40 quid a ticket. They can afford anyone. They chose you. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's just fantastic. Honestly, I'm a very grateful guy. This should not be happening. This, the a kind of career that I have should have stopped years ago. Honestly, it should have stopped years ago. I still cannot believe uh, we are doing the kind of business I'm getting, the kind of offers I can keep getting. It's just an amazing experience, an amazing life. Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the world's biggest stars and some of my favorite people. 25 years this year I've been talking to stars and I have to say this one is probably going to be my favorite. Barry Manilow, what an honor. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Alex. Thank you. I've got to tell you, all the years I've been interviewing stars, so few can fill a room here in Las Vegas, really? in London, in Hong Kong, Singapore, wherever you turn up. I mean, what an incredible thrill that wherever you go, people want to see you. That's not guaranteed, is it? It is. And I keep remembering the days when they didn't want to see me. <laughs> yeah, because they were, you don't, you're too young to remember. See, I'm, I'm now I'm beloved, but I was behated for <laughs> many years, many years. So, um, and suddenly it flipped over. I don't know how, maybe, you know, after a while, you just, they just give in. And um, <laughs> I'm right already, because um, I wouldn't go away. So, um, and things just flipped over and um, everybody was having a, everybody always had a good time with what I did, but um, I just, you know, they just didn't want to admit it. Now, um, everybody's okay with it. Everybody's okay with it. At this point in your career, when you stand in the wings here at the Westgate in Las Vegas, and you know you've got several thousand people waiting for you, is there more pressure to sound like Barry Manilow? We all know your hits. We know what you sound like, and we know how they need to be sung. Oh, no, I never think about that. Honestly, I never think about sounding like... No, I, you know, I hope that my voice is in shape. I hope that my body's in shape. Um, and uh, I hope the sound system is good, and I uh, hope the lights are good, and, um, uh, but most of all, I uh, hope the audience is good. And 99% um, uh, of the time, because you know, I come from Brooklyn, and in Brooklyn, 
um, you raised to, to, you know, it's never going to work out. It's, it's going to be the worst evening of your whole <laughs> life. So before I go out, I have to get rid of that voice. And um, most of the time, just about all the time, they're very friendly. These audiences are uh, very friendly. And um, I have a great time with them. Really, I have a great time with these people. There are a few people in the world who have the type of fan you have. I've interviewed a few of them. There's Cliff Richard in England. He has it. There's Elton John. There are a few people where we just love you. And your fans will come this week to all three shows. They will fly in and stay and see everything. How do you manufacture that? Because I think in this PR savvy world, nobody's quite worked it out. Is it of its time or is it just doing it for as long as you have? Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I meet them backstage, you know, before these shows, <clears throat> because I have this um, organization called the uh, Manilow Music Project, and we raise money to get instruments into schools that are running out of them, because all the schools in the country are running out of instruments. Terrible. Really terrible. The first thing that gets caught is music and arts in all the high schools. And when I found that out about 15 years ago, I had to do something. So I, I formed the Manilow Music Project. So. Uh, and the way we get uh, money for the Mandela Music Project is I, I do what a lot of artists do. I, I do a meet and greet with the fans. And we charge some money for it, and it goes right into the Mandela Music Project. Everybody knows that. And um, they come and visit with me uh, before the shows. So, I get, so this is a long answer. So I get to meet them. I know who these people are. I've known who they were from the very beginning. They're great people. I mean it. I take them so seriously. I would not have the life I had have without these strangers. Um, uh, these these are strangers who gave me this incredible uh, career and an incredible life. So I love meeting them. I wish I could spend more time with them. They're great, and they've always been like that from the very beginning. Who are, these people that I met after the shows? They're just they're just great people. I just they're nice. They're nice. They're good-hearted. Um, they're intelligent, they're, I, I, I love having conversations with them. I never take them for granted. I'm serious, I never take them for granted. They're just great people. That's what I, that's what, that's why I meet them. I've probably seen your show 30 times over the years in big arenas and here in Las Vegas. Yeah. And the one thing about your show is without you in it, it's already a good show. Oh, add in the jackets and then add in you. And now we've got a spectacular. And that's what's glorious, isn't it? I mean, the hits stand up for themselves. The show stands up for himself. And then we add in a mega star sex symbol like yourself. <laughs> and we've got a party. Yeah, I, I work very hard on that. Is it still an obsession? I mean, do you stay awake at night worrying about the show? I do. I give everybody notes every morning. I look at the show every night. I'm crazy. I, I, I admit it. They all know I'm crazy. <laughs> and it's four o'clock in the morning. I get up and I look at the show the night before and I make notes and I give it to all the people that, um, that uh, work there and I make the show better or change things around or come up with ideas. And um, I've always been like this. I just, you know, I just wanted to be as great as I can for these people. You can't be good at everything. Are you the best pianist? Are you the best singer? Are you the best performer, the best writer? Because really, you're not just the triple threat. You're the quadruple threat. Oh, you're very sweet to say that. But I don't, I don't think I'm the best any of those things that you just said. I'm pretty good at putting it together. I like putting it together. I like putting the show together. I like putting albums together. Uh, I like writing music. Um, no, I would never consider myself... Uh, a good singer or a great pianist. I'm not. My musicians are, are head and I used to be pretty good, but um, I, I'm not, not as good as I used to be. And as far as singing go, goes, the, the thing I do really good is I interpret a lyric really good. I know that I do that because you can't do even now for 40 years and make it sound like um, I, I've never done it before. And I think that's what they're feeling because I feel that way. I don't, when I do even now, I surprise myself um, about this song. I, I, it's as if I've never done it before. Um, that's, that's what goes, it goes for everything I do on a stage. It's as if it's the first time. That I'm very proud of. That, uh, and I, I mean it. And the band and the singers are always amazed that I can still keep it fresh the way I do. Um, and so am I, but I'm very proud that I'm able to do that. And I'm really able to interpret a lyric because I really believe it. I believe what I'm singing. 
And then, of course, we look at these songs. I tried singing one once at karaoke. That was my first mistake. These aren't easy. Even now starts right down here and it ends up in the rafters. You don't make life easy for yourself, do you? No, I, I, listen, I never started off wanting to be a singer. So I'm more surprised than anybody <laughs> that I can start down there and end up there. Every night I am. So, you know, I don't take the singing thing uh, seriously. I try my best. But I, I've always known that I'm not a great singer. Luther Vandross is a great singer. George Michael was a great singer. You know, that, that, that's the, that, those are the people that are great singers. Me, I'm a pretty good interpreter of a lyric. That's what I think I do best. This show is not only a love letter to your music, but also your life, and we get to find out all about it. And from the beginnings of the happy birthday to the megastar here in Las Vegas, we get to hear your story. And it is remarkable. Was there a point in your career when you thought you'd made it? If you ask that question to anybody, everybody's going to be stumped, because you never really think you did. <laughs> you never really think you've hit it. What uh, I find fascinating when I talk to someone like you is your perception of yourself, because I'm in the presence of a megastar. Of all the people I've ever met, you're as big as it gets. I mean, that sincerely and I mean it honestly do you just see yourself as Barry who gets up in the morning and has to do a job I do yes I do yeah ask anybody I do I don't I don't even I'm always surprised when people are you know kind of scared when I say hello to them or something I I'm just another I'm just a musician I'm just a working musician that's what I see myself as you come into the UK on September 14th to do proms in the park they said there were 65,000 people <laughs> That's, that's, wow, that's, that's a lot of people. <laughs> Does it change your performance? Does it change you? Or I, I wonder how you perceive this because you've done some amazing venues, the best venues in the world, and you've played collectively to millions of people, never mind 60,000. I sing to one person every night. So if there are 2,000 or 5,000 or 65,000, I'm still singing to that one person. It's not going to change for me. I mean, how exciting kind of ever be the 65,000 people but it won't change my performance I'm still singing to one person um, and uh, uh, I, you know as far as that goes you know maybe I'll have a little nerves or excitement but once I start um, it's pretty much um, the same as it always is I try to crawl into the story of the song and sing it to one person and that's my job. But, you know, it's always exciting to hear the roar of the crowd, you know. And what's magnificent about your back catalogue is we all know virtually every word and we will sing them back at you. That volume is probably going to be as loud as it gets and thrilling. Is that still surprising even tonight when you start the first word of the first song and the first note and we're already on the same page? Well, you know, as long as it makes them happy, it makes me happy. In the beginning, you know, I thought, don't sing even now with me. I'm, I'm performing. How dare you? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't mind anymore because I see what's going on out there. They love to do it. Well, that's great. That's what I'm there for. I'm there to make them. It's all about them. It's not about me. You know, you ask, you know, your question before, you know, is it about, am I a super, really, no, I am there for those people. That's all I think about. I'm there for them. And if that makes them happy, I'm Sing along with me, folks. <laughs> you do remind us you're a sex symbol several times oh, in the show. I'm kidding. You know I'm <laughs> kidding around. Please. <laughs> Having said that, I mean, we see that picture of you and the way the women swoon in the audience is quite remarkable. When you look at those pictures, and just yesterday I was interviewing Wayne Newton, who was telling me stories about Elvis. And when you think he did 800 shows Ooh. on this site Ooh. and probably used this dressing room, and I think even that bar was where he used to warm up. Maybe. Um, what? a wonderful career in life you've had to be around these people would you indulge me with some Vegas stories to begin and, and the people you met and worked with because there really isn't anybody you haven't worked with well I don't I get out much <laughs> I really don't I really don't Alex I don't get out much I, I've never I've never been a part of that world I, I hang with my band and my singers and those are my friends and then I've got a whole batch of friends when I'm home just regular people honestly from the very beginning I stayed away from it I did I um, you know I have a couple of people who are I, I guess you would call them they're in you know they're they got names they got make albums and all but really I've never really been into that part of it honestly um, my stories uh, Vegas 
I am staying in the same suite I've stayed in ever. It is the craziest Las Vegas suite you've ever seen. It is so Las Vegas. <laughs> it is so awful and wonderful at the same time. It's really, um, it's, uh, they must have spent the fortune about you know, 15, 20 years ago. And I hope they never change this thing. It is one of the great, great um, tributes to Las Vegas. I hope they never change it. They get, and that when I get, get walk into that suite, I am in Las Vegas. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's way on the millionth floor, and, you, and yeah. all, all windows you can see the entire strip. I am, I am so in Las Vegas. I may as well be I don't know, Shecky Green or something. <laughs> And it is amazing. I can't remember who said it, but it costs millions to look this trashy. And that really is Vegas. Yeah, you've got to keep that to keep oh, it Vegas. It's, it's just so great. It's so great. Now, that, that's, that's my thing of, of Vegas. That's when I think of Vegas, I think of that crazy suite. I hope they never change it. You've done so many gigs in the UK and the Palladium is such a part of everybody's career. Yes, yes. I know a, a dear friend of yours, Lorna Loft, I mean, her mum and the Judy Garland stories go together hand in hand. And of course, you've played that venue so many times and we want to see you there again. I, I saw you last year in an arena. And again, it's unfortunate you're so popular because if you were less popular, do smaller venues. There's something about your show, though, that is really one man and a piano. And that's what we get here in Vegas, which mm -hmm. is so touching. Um, and, and it never gets old, does it? I look around at the great piano man there aren't as many around but it's still so moving just the fingers the piano and the man it, it's gorgeous well you know they're not writing uh, 32 bar songs anymore mm -hmm. and they're not writing lyrics that people can you know do what I can do with my catalog um, and that really you know that's really too bad I mean like I say on in the show they're still making great sounding records but the but the the art of writing a great pop song is dying it really is and um, it's all about the machinery and, the, you know, there's great sounding records, but the art of doing a wonderful 32 bar song is, is, is dying. And so I love doing what I'm doing. I'm, I'm one of the few people that are still doing me, Elton, Billy Joel, and maybe a handful more sit at the piano and sing Weekend in New England or Even Now and, and their catalog. And I can't think of too many more mm -hmm. out there, but, you know, um, there may be. There may be out there. I, you know, I'm, uh, I can't think of any right now. But I, I know that, that when I try to listen to the pop radio, there's no, mm. you know, there's no melodies. The melodies have hit the skids. It's all about rhythm, and it's great. It's all about rhythm, but where the melodies go? Yeah. You mentioned Elton there. I mean, back in the 70s and 80s, we look at what he did so flamboyant and outrageous. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned also the fact that you just stayed out of it and did your music. I mean, do you have great admiration for him for what he did? Because he was a pioneer, right? I mean, and to think that some little island England has created two of the biggest headliners at Caesar's Palace, Coliseum, Rod and Elton, is extraordinary. We're so tiny, yet the impact these guys have had. He's amazing. Yeah, he started like five, six years before I did, so I was a fan. You know, I had those albums, starting with uh, your song, uh, and you know, and not never even dreaming that I would even make an album to get to forget about you know having this career. I was just his fan, and I still am. Uh, he's still one of the great great songwriters that we have, um, and he's still doing it. He's still making records that are filled with wonderful uh, melodies, lyrics, chord changes, and he still sounds great. Um, it's not many, there's not many of us uh, doing this, you know. The, it's a whole different style of um, of music, um, of making a record, you know. It's it's and it's fine, you know. Let them do it. I just wish they would go back to some melodies. That's all. I'm, that's it. Just just where the melodies go. <laughs> <laughs> Last year you were in England. You'd just been ill before you came. Let me ask you the question, how are you? I'm fine. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, I'm very old. I should not be able to do this. You saw me go up that stairs. That's 14 steps up there every night and 14 steps down. You would think I'd be in a wheelchair or something. But I, you know, I, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. But I, I feel the same as I've always felt. And, you know, I still have my hair. Uh, you know, I look pretty much the same as I always look. I don't, you know, I'm waiting for it to get old. But so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> and then we look at the voice itself. What care do you have to give to that to make sure it sounds as good as it it does because these records are going to be played forever yeah. you're going to stand in front of 60,000 at Hyde gonna, Park is it a lot of work? you're going to hate me I still sing in the same key that the records are in you know that 
Yeah, I, and I'm waiting to tell the band to lower the key, but I don't. I, so far, I don't have to. You know, I'm sure. I'm sure one of these days something horrible is going to happen, but so, so far I'm lucky. What about the neuroses of getting on a plane or sitting in an airport or sitting next to me coughing or something like that? Do you get into all that? Because this can be really destructive. You have so many performers who can't do what they do, just worrying about losing their voice. Well, I don't tour the way I used to. I stopped doing that uh, two years ago. And this was a, a godsend, this uh, offer to come back to the uh, old Hilton, uh, to the Westgate now. Um, because that keeps the band working. Because I didn't want to lose the band, but I didn't want to stay on the road. And this was the perfect um, compromise. So I keep everybody working, and I don't have to take those planes that you're talking about. Um, Because it was, uh, that finally got me. You know, I I take my own plane. I don't have one, but we rent our own. So at least I stopped going into uh, into the airports the way I used to. It was 40 years of airports, 40 years of hotels. It finally, it finally got to me, uh, and it's gotten to everybody that that, that start, started off with me. I read the same interview that I gave over and over <laughs> by every rock and roll group and all these, and I understand it. Um, but I don't want to stop, so I just got to pick my uh, pick where I'm going and uh, when I when I go. But I don't do those one nighters anymore. When are we going to get you back in the UK after this gig? I mean, 60,000 people are going to see you. We're going to tell 60,000. It's going to be broadcast to 12 million, possibly 15 million. On a good day, 20 million who are going to want to see you. Can we have you back? You're scaring the (laughs) shit out of me. (laughs) There goes my idea of singing to one person. (laughs) When are we going to get you back after September? I mean, you said it was going to be the last tour. you And you keep saying it's going to be the last tour. But we need you back. You can't stop. Oh, you're sweet. Um, I I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not in charge of that they come to me and my, my my husband manager says would you like to i i am dr no no i say no to everything no <laughs> no i am dr no but um <laughs> i'm sure there'll be some sort of a um not a tour but there'll be a visit to england uh, in the near future because i can't resist them i just can't um it, you know first of all they've been so great to me uh, and uh, and I know that they love it. They love coming to see our show. It's a big party for everybody. So I'll, I I know I'll be back there, but I haven't got no one's told me anything except for that proms thing. You mentioned there, Gary. I was at Mark Worrell's wedding. A mutual friend of ours who works with you yeah. in England, and I met Gary, and he's such a lovely man. Isn't it great that love now can be love, and we don't have all that nonsense? It must be wonderful for you to sit here and be able to say, "My husband, Gary." Yeah, it is. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I went through many, many, many years where we couldn't do that, and it would have killed my career. It would in immediately, as soon as the word got out of my mouth, my career would have been over. It's so shocking to hear that, because as I sit here as a 39-year-old man, I really can't resonate with that, because it seems so stupid, if nothing else. Yeah, I know. It was stupid then, but it was true. Mm. And uh, everybody knew it, and everybody watched it. We had to, we had to watch out making a mistake uh, not that anybody didn't know by the way I people are very smart everybody I, well I, I thought you know I wasn't hiding anything <laughs> but I wasn't I was also not publicizing it but because I you know if I publicize it I, I, I'm pretty sure that it would especially in the 70s and 80s no way no way. Was there a moment when you thought it's okay now what why did you decide to finally do because we could be sitting here today pretending couldn't we yeah um uh, I, I, I guess there was a time when it, it suddenly became okay a couple of years ago. And look what's going on with uh, Mayor Pete. You know, it's fantastic that it's gone that far into politics that, you know, he can, he can be honest and he doesn't have to hide. And it's great, um, you know, it's great for him. And it's great for us who were through, went through the mill <laughs> of the other side. You know, it's great to watch it. Do you think there's more of a problem here? And I know you've got to be careful how you answer this. Maybe I shouldn't even be asking it. But I don't think we cared or care as much in the UK as America cares. There is a difference, isn't there? Yeah, I didn't know that. Uh, you know, well, Look at I, Elton, for example. Look at Freddie Mercury, yeah. for example. There was never hatred. There was just love. Right. I didn't live there, so I didn't know what the temperature was there. Uh, you know, I'd go there, I'd come back. But, you know, when I started... I was on the cover of Teen Beat magazine. Right. Well, you know, that was the good news and the bad news. Because I knew I was gay, 
And I knew I had a hit record, and I was on the cover of Teen Beat magazine. Now what do I do? Right. Now what do you do, Manilo? Right. And then, of course, we look at the love and reaction after you came out, and everybody was just thrilled for you, including every single one of your fans. There was no negativity that I read anywhere. Not one note. Not one note. And, you know, I knew it. I knew that would happen. I just believe in these people. I knew they would be okay with it. All they ever cared about was my happiness, honestly. All they cared about was, you know, that if I was okay. And I think they were thrilled that I had somebody in my life like Gary. And is that the most important thing? I know your organization is a family affair from top to bottom, <laughs> yeah. and they've all got your back and you're all in it together. Is that important? Because I see people in show business write books and say they've lost this millions and that millions, and they were shafted by this one and that one. Keep it in the family. It does happen, but you've got less chance, haven't you, of being screwed over? Uh, I was screwed over in the beginning. You know, I lost everything, everything wow. before I met Gary because I was an idiot from Brooklyn who never got any money. I mean, I didn't know anything. You've heard the story over and over from all these young people who suddenly become millionaires because they get hit records. They don't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to do with it. I hired somebody who I trusted and I shouldn't have. And um, suddenly I found myself with $11,000 in the bank. That was it. And that was after I write the songs and Mandy and all that touring. And it was $11,000 in the bank. And thank God I met Gary because he's such a genius. He put me together with him and uh, a couple of great guys. And thank goodness my career kept going and we could make it up. But I, you know, I blew it too. But I really didn't know anything about money. Here's an interesting story. After Mandy came out, <clears throat> uh, Clive had a, um, a, uh, a party for all of his executives down in San Diego. And I was in living in Manhattan, and, uh, and he wanted me there because it was all about Mandy. His Arista was a brand new record label. So I bounced a check at the grocery store to get on that plane. And I, <laughs> and I got on the plane, and I went to San Diego, and Clive knocked on my door and said, you know, Mandy's been a big hit, and he handed me a check for a million dollars. And that morning I had bounced a check. So I used it as a bookmark for about a week before I <laughs> said, well, what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> and dare I ask, what did you do with it? Well, you know, I found, <laughs> I found this guy that who I, you know, somebody recommended that I trusted, but this is what happens to all of us. I had no experience with that kind of money. Hmm. And here we are today in another world where you don't technically have to do anything, let alone get on a plane and come to London. Is it still thrilling to be asked? Because they could pick anyone. I always say this in these kind of gigs, anyone is welcome. There's 60,000 people paying 40 quid a ticket. They can afford anyone. They chose you. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's just fantastic. Honestly, I'm a very grateful guy. This should not be happening. The, the, a kind of career that I have should have stopped years ago. Honestly, it should have stopped years ago. I still cannot believe uh, we are doing the kind of business I'm getting the kind of offers I can keep getting. It's just an amazing experience, an amazing life. I toured for 20 years with a man called Ken Dodd in England, who was our biggest variety star ever. And and 91, he passed away last year, and I asked him six months you know, before. Days, I say, 91, that's not so old. Because <laughs> I've been in my age. <laughs> but go on, yes. I asked him if he'd retire, and he said, you only retire from doing things you don't want to do to do what you do want to do, and I'm doing what I want to do. Is that the same? Uh, exactly. Uh, really, I didn't retire, I don't, it's not even in my, 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 my vocabulary. Honestly, I would never do that. I just, I had to get off the road. But that's not retiring. I just had to get off the road. It was enough with the room service. Yes. <laughs> I hear there's a new album in the pipeline, which is a follow-up to a previous CD. Are we allowed to talk about it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've got three albums in the pipeline. I'm making three at a time. The, the one you're talking about is a follow-up to a wonderful album called Night Songs. It's standards, but standards that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> well, only if you're really hip will you know these old standards. And so I did one, Night Songs, and I got nominated for a Grammy, and it's just me playing the piano and singing. And it's just, you know, you have me in your living room. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people loved it. So I did Night Songs Volume 2. 
And it's another 12 songs that no one's ever heard of, but they're fantastic, written by Gershwin and Irving Berlin and all the greats, all the greats. So maybe somebody will hear it and say, gee, what's that? That's a really great song. Okay. You never know. And then the second one is an album of uh, totally original songs. And I think uh, the uh, people who like what I do have been waiting for an original album for a long time because <coughs> Clive had me do these uh, Decades albums, which was fun to do, but, you know, <laughs> this wouldn't be my first choice. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it was fun to do, and as an arranger, you know, I had a good time. Uh, as a producer, I had a good time uh, doing these old songs. I think the fans, you know, they were, they were okay with one of them, but the four of them, really? But um, it was okay, that was, that was the Clive thing, and I, I love him, and I believe him when he says these things will work, and they did, it and one of them, the first one entered at number one, the second one entered at number two, was, I don't know anything about it. I was gonna it. say, you're sending this as a flop, but all these records no. were hugely, hugely Huge. popular. They were hugely <laughs> popular, I loved, I did, I loved doing them, but I also love writing a lot. So, and I think the, uh, the people that like what I do are waiting for original songs, they really are. So this second of the three albums, are, is our totally new original songs, and that's coming out great. When is this going to be? We need I'm not, it. I'm in the middle of, of putting together right Hurry up, now. Tempest Fugit. Right. Come on, we <laughs> haven't got time to wait, Barry. We need a new album. Right. How easy is it to write a new song as good as the stuff you were writing back in the day that we're singing along with tonight? In 30 years, can I come and see you and I'll be singing along to the new stuff you're writing tomorrow? Maybe. Maybe. They're good. I, listen, all I can tell you is that they're good. You may think they stink, but I think they're good. Do you know, do you know in your heart when a song's great or amazing? I know when I like it. I know when I know I've done a good job. I have been very, very bad at predicting what's a hit record. I, uh, uh, you know, I've never really liked pop music. <laughs> really, and I wound up in, in that world for so many years, but I really never paid much attention to it. I just do what I do. That's it. You know, E.B. White once said, um, that uh, for, for an artist, if you, if you look up and smell the trend machine, you're lost. And I didn't even know that, but that's what I do. I don't smell the trend machine. I just do what feels good. That's how Could It Be Magic happened. I, eight minute, an eight minute cut, that, you know, hey, that's a single, hey? Eh? Eight minutes, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> <laughs> and when somebody covers a song like that, whether it be Donna Summer or Take That, and you buy your next private jet, I mean, th there's the compliment that these people have done it, but then the success as uh, Dolly talks about with I Will Always Love You. I mean, what a thrill to have songs that people cover and make bigger and better and they always come back to Barry. It's, it's great. I mean, not many people do that because just like Whitney or some other artists, you, you, we put our, our imprint on these songs and it's difficult for somebody else to grab it. But uh, Could Be Magic has been done and that, that's great because that's a, a, that's a bona fide, wonderful song and anybody can cover that. But some of the other ones, you know, even though I didn't write, I write the songs. I doubt if anybody would ever want to do that because, you know, it, it was so big, you know, that it would be, it'd be hard for somebody else to, to grab that one. I think we had two albums. You said three. There's a third one, yeah. And we'll find out about that we'll soon. Find that one. Yeah. Well, Barry, you don't need my affirmation. Nothing I can say to you tonight is necessary, but you are such a classy legend and star. And to be in the presence of someone who walks on a stage and from the second that pin focus hits has a magic in that arena and people are just so thrilled to see you. It's so rare and so thrilling and so lovely. Thank you so much for your time. You didn't need to do this. You're great, Alex. Thank you very much for being on my side all these, all these times. Thank you.